joined SASDOC a little while ago and are part of their founder circles. It's been absolutely brilliant for us. We first came into it to further our community, our reach, our network, and to learn from some of the world-class speakers that SASDOC has come and speak. And I have to say, it has been absolutely superb for us. Welcome to the SaaS Revolution Show. Puneet Kataria, CEO and co-founder of Customer Success Box. Welcome, Puneet. Thank you, Alex. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, appreciate you inviting me to your amazing show. No, no, great. Great to have you on. Whereabouts are you uh, at the moment? At the moment, I'm taking this recording from a uh, suburb of New Delhi, in New Delhi in India, and uh, it's in Gurgaon. I'm assuming many of your listeners have been here already. But yeah, yeah uh, I, I think many have. We've got a, a really strong contingent of audience at SASDOC uh, in India. We've been running SASDOC local events in, in India, in, in um, uh, Chennai and, and Bangalore for, well, uh, certainly pre-COVID, we were, we were running them in person. We may have done like one or two virtually, but obviously we're looking forward to coming back, you know, in person as well. Um, so, and, and I'm hoping to make the, like I mentioned earlier, the kind of the trip over uh, at some point um, uh, would be great. So it's, a, it's really kind of high on my list to, to come over. So hopefully we can make that happen within the next 12 to 24 months. So Puneet, we, we always kind of like start, we ask our guests a little bit about themselves. Uh, so tell us who is Puneet uh, Kataria? Lovely. That's a, that's a tough question, uh, but I'll try to, try to cover as much as I can. So to start with, let me, let me say I'm, I'm vegan by, by choice for the last couple of years and uh, holding okay so far. And outside of that, I think I'm just trying to, I'm trying to, I always say that I've been in the industry for about 20 years, so I'm quite a veteran and I've, I've seen it all, but I'm intern of a founder. So this is my, this is my second startup technically, and uh, I'm trying to do my best, believe in the team, not, and, and I believe that the, that the fun is in the, in the journey or in the climb, top can be lonely. So I think uh, try to enjoy every, every moment as I, as I go through this. In terms, of, in terms of businesses and the values that sort of drive me, I, I believe that the, the toughest job is to unlearn stuff that you've learned because what got me here so far won't get me there. That means that the world is constantly changing and you have to constantly adapt. So the, so the big are going to get outrun by the adaptable and the nimble folks. I believe 50% of whatever I'm doing and probably what I'm going to be advising and sharing and uh, sharing and saying is going to be wrong. I just don't know which 50%. So probably over the years, I'm going to figure out which 50% was right or wrong. So essentially, you know, trying to build an opinion and place bets while at the same time trying to, trying to be humble enough to know that, oh, you know, we lost that bet while we, while we made that quite right. Hopefully you're going to be right more than 50% and that's what success will look like. Always try to be a better human being first. That's a tough one, by the way. As more and more conflict and responsibilities sort of come in, but uh, but always try to remind ourselves of that as a team and as as an individual. Always believe in helping others, not to, not necessarily selling. I think selling is a selling is an outcome. Uh, selling is a sort of an after effect of helping someone. And similarly, when you're delivering value and customer success, retention or renewal is uh, is a non event not not so you as long as you're delivering value retention or renewal is going to be a non event and not not the primary piece yeah i think uh, those are some of the values that that sort of drive me as an individual awesome and so why why did you found like what is your second startup i don't, I don't know if it's your second saas company uh, but yeah why did you find found customer success box and what is the problem that it's uh, solving? So customer success box, as, it, as we have it in the name, is a customer success platform. We are, in, we are the, we're probably the only AI-powered customer success platform, definitely the leading AI-powered customer success platform. The, the problem that we are trying, trying to solve, so I've been, I started as an engineer, just quickly background, started as an engineer 20 years ago, and then uh, somewhere five, six years into, into doing engineering, I... I, I moved towards selling software and I've been selling SaaS software since 2006. Fast forward to my last employment, I've played like been selling for donkey years in SaaS. 
my last job was VP of worldwide sales for another SaaS company. And that's when I realized that um, I've signed up my incentive plan, which is usually on acquisition, but in this company was based on MRR, which is monthly recurring revenue. I was like, you know, big deal. I know my gig. I know my game uh, in sales and I'll, and I'll be able to take home big fat incentives as I always do. Fantastic. Two months in, three months in, everybody in my team is kicking ass and making incentive except me. It's like, something must be wrong. My acquisition team is like doing amazing. Why am I not making any incentive? And then that, that's when about seven years ago, I learned about a leaky bucket. We're adding like 100 customers every month and we're losing 100 customers every month. So it's like running on a treadmill, no matter how hard I run, I basically don't go anywhere. And I can, I can keep smiling by, by looking in the mirror that I'm running hard. But so, so that was my introduction to customer, customer churn. And then I had to solve the problem, start learning about customer success. And eventually, you know, that is when I started putting the team together, started putting the practice together, even technology. And, uh, and essentially, you know, fast forward to today, I'm all chips in into customer success platform. So in so many ways, I'm basically trying to help myself back seven years ago, uh, because unfortunately, the problem still exists. And there's so many of SaaS businesses, subscription economy, uh, subscription businesses who are sort of struggling with, with churn. Yeah, no, definitely. We, we had a really great episode on recently where we had the, the CEO of Slidebean come on, uh, a guy called Kaya. And yeah, just going to explain around his problem that, uh, and I can't remember the exact figures, but you, you know, hyp hyp hypothetically saying, you know, they were getting, you know, 100, 200K new MRR each month, but experiencing the same in churn, you know, and had a serious kind of churn problem. And it was, it was just kind of really interesting, you know, to hear him kind of talk about it. And, and for, uh, for, I think one of the big, biggest pieces of advice for him, for early stage SaaS companies was really to, to think about churn, you know, really early on, uh, you know, and how you can protect yourself uh, uh, against that. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, important. It's great to see that there's solutions out there like Customer Success Box. And uh, well, what about the, the company? So how many years have you been running it? What data can you share? You venture back, so you bootstrapped. Yeah, it'd be good to get a better picture. Right. So, so in fact, you know, just Closing your last point, so one of the data points on, on customer, you know, customer success and customer churn, since you, since you bring that up, you'd be surprised out of only 10% of SaaS businesses get to the magical figure of 125% plus MRR or ARR net retention, essentially. And that's the, that's the figure that we basically try to help businesses get to. Obviously, without technology, it is impossible to, to go beyond, you know, 100% and even 100% assumes that all your customers continue to renew. But if you're trying to do upsells and, and drive all of that stuff, you will 100% require technology if you want to, you know, get to that 125% magical number. So coming back to your, uh, coming back to the, the company, we've been, um, uh, so we started about 2018. We started in an accelerator, started as an experiment, trying to see, but uh, very quickly we were able to get to our first 10 customers. We'll get into more details on, on that if you want more. But we, but we raised, uh, immediately after that, we raised about a, raised a small seed round of about a million dollars. And uh, since then, we've not required any, any new funding. We've been running fairly comfortably on our own. But along the way, we've been very blessed with the kind of customers that, that have come in, who have supported us, and, and of course, trusted us with our technology. And in return, we've hopefully delivered We've delivered our end of the promise as well, and that's the that's the equation uh, that we've been. In terms of, in, in terms of um, the customer base, we largely help at a at a larger umbrella, reaching out to subscription economy, so anybody in the subscription economy with a digital signal, preferably coming in, the low hanging fruit or the or the most obvious sort of a customer base is going to be around uh, the other SaaS businesses, because obviously that's our comfort zone as well, being a SaaS business ourselves. And, and SaaS businesses are usually early adopters, very early to adopt new technologies, new strategies, new, new, new stuff. Uh, so that's one, but we have helped customers beyond SaaS as well. We've, we have, we've had customers with IoT. Uh, I remember one of our customers basically had parking devices, like parking sensors as you park a car, 
it'll notify customer success box, like customer success box will get notified which parking slot is getting used the max so that they can, you know, sort of try to monetize and, and maintain and sustain all of those pieces. We've helped customers. Another one with a vending machine management, they, they, they used to see, you know, which vending machine is getting utilized the most and then so that they can operationally and, and from a success perspective, uh, work and deploy different strategies based on that data point. But majority of our customers are SaaS businesses, but those were a couple of exceptions. Yeah, we've got, so for example, you've got customers like Orange Business Services. They're of course huge global customer for us. We've got customers like Lead Squared, which is a MarTech CRM, a MarTech, uh, MarTech player. Uh, they're like, I think about 50 million or so funded, very prominent, especially in the, in the uh, Southeast Asia. We've got customers like Hubilo. They are, uh, they're a great uh, virtual event management platform, I think doing fantastic, one of the global leaders. We've got customers like Enchanto. These guys are, uh, they're, they're doing a lot of chatbots and uh, stuff around that. We've got customers like Exatel, great cloud telephony. So yeah, uh, to, to name a few. How did you get your first paying customers? You know, what, it, what, what lessons can you share and insights uh, around that? So uh, one is how do we get it? And the other is a lesson. So, so let, me, let me try to focus on, on the lessons. But, and I'm sure if some of your listeners are like about to dive in and, and sort of weren't wondering that why am I not getting my first 10 customers? So here's me, my learning. My first company, and uh, I don't think I've shared this on any podcast, and I hope I, I think it should be fine. The first company, we, we believed that there was an idea, there's something that we wanted to do, we built the product, and then we started to market the hell out of it, okay? And we struggled for, for, I think, more than a year to get to our first 10 customers, like no kidding. For more than a year, like that's no joke, because I've never, I've always helped, you know, being in the business, being in, being in the, you know, uh, SaaS businesses, uh, working for a lot of global co- customers, global companies, I know how to how to take a company from millions of dollars to tens of millions of dollars and from tens of millions of dollars to hundreds of millions of dollars, but I've never ever experienced, like I said, I'm an intern of a founder, I've never experienced how do you get your first 10 customers? And that was like a very new playbook I had to figure it out. I had to figure it out. So in the first business, we sort of struggled. And in the second one, they just came in without any effort. And I was like, whoa. So this is the momentum that you're supposed to have. So, so very specifically, and we did everything in the first business as well. Very specifically in the second one, uh, we had two streams, but our first stream was we identified about 100 founders, which we believe were uh, our ideal customers. We largely targeted startups because we are a very small, unknown brand. When you're starting and obviously the product's very new, that means it might be buggy. It will definitely not be very feature rich. I'm talking like four or five years ago. With all of those pieces, uh, you don't want to go after enterprises, enterprises, unless like it's a completely, uh, you know, new idea and you try to solve a problem which which they are bleeding and, and there is no solution. They might give you an opportunity, but but otherwise, uh, you know, if, if they've got alternatives, even if that's Excel sheet or a CRM, then they would want to uh, make sure that the products like at least at certain level. But the startups are always willing to you know give you a chance. And so we reached out to early stage businesses and um, those businesses, uh, we, we did a campaign, reached out to 100 founders. I think we probably hit 70 or 80 inboxes out of which we got about 35, 37 odd responses, which was huge, which actually signed up. So our, our statement was that, hey, we're building something which is solved, blah, 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 this problem that you've got churn as an issue. You don't know which account is getting value, which one's not. We will calculate real-time account health and we'll give you a handle on every account. And uh, because you don't know that, we're starting to build the platform, but we don't have that ready. Would you like to sign up for an early access and a try or, or the first demo we're going to do three months from today? But you have to sign up this form. And that form was not just give your email. That form had like 20 fields. We wanted to make sure that they're seriously interested. So the form was deliberately you know, put together with a lot of resistance in it to make sure that uh, people who are not interested should not sign in. And we had like 25 people filling up that form. And when we started to do those trials, you know, sorry, started to do those demos, our, you know, 
I think about 60, 70% of our UI was not working because that was still work in progress. And we said, the account health is working and that's going to get calculated. And that's the key thing. Everything else, you click, nothing happens right now, but that's going to sort of roll out, you know, over the, over the months and quarters and years. And people like totally comfortable, you know, we signed up, I think our first three customers in one week of the demos. And that was like, wow, that's the momentum that you really need. And that's when you know that you're not selling, you know, vitamins, you're actually selling uh, painkillers. So if you, so in terms of learning, so there you go. I hope that was helpful. No, definitely. I mean, it's good things there. Obviously you knew your ICP, created this list, a hundred accounts to go out, you know, did some great outbound with the messaging. So I think, you know, some, some really good kind of lessons there. So, so what, what, what about Alex? Yeah. Sorry, correction. At that point in time, we thought we knew our ICP. Today, that's not ICP. Uh, so our first, so our first entire, you know, set of ten customers were not the ideal customers. We, we bumped into different problems with them, and then over time, we realized that's not the market that we can serve. Or we are not sort of well. We we've not built the technology. We, those are not our strengths to help startups. So now we are basically mid market and 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 above, like anybody with ten million or maybe at least five million dollars in ARR. Is the, is the businesses that we that we can only serve now. But that's been a different learning curve. But that doesn't mean that, I'm not saying that your first cut 10 customers are going to be your perfect 10 customers, but that's how you can get your first 10 customers for sure. Maybe, I guess, from the first paying customers to maybe some of the lessons you share, you know, in running the business over, I guess, uh, you know, since 2018, you, you know, uh, what, what are some of the key lessons that you can share with the audience? So I, I think in terms of, in terms of, uh, the, the lessons, I think there, there are so many, and I think every stage you learn different things and different things become important. So this, every lesson that I, I think a lot of your listeners probably getting, and, and like me, I'm one of your listeners of your podcast, uh, we all get, you know, sort of overwhelmed by so many lessons and sometimes even conflicting ones. Uh, but I think I'll, the, the big disclaimer here I'll give is like, make sure they're sort of apt for your stage. And, and the way I always filter lessons, and this is probably one of the best ways, this is one of my lessons, is that you want to know your strengths and weaknesses. So, so for example, I am very poor at spellings. So I can spend, you know, 20 hours a week trying to improve my spellings and probably I can go for a go from um, level on a scale of one to three, three being the lowest, I can probably go to four or five, right? On the other hand, let's say I'm very good at talking and, and speaking and I'm already at eight. I'm not saying I'm eight, but, but let's assume that. And, but if I spend like even two hours or four hours, I can easily get to nine and 10 and there I can quickly be the leader and, and get, gain more. So I think every lesson, likewise, you should see whether it, it meets your strengths or not. And, uh, and the, the second lesson which sort of follows that is there will be things that, that I'm personally, for example, not very good at. And realizing what I'm not good at empowers me to know what strengths I need in my team. The team should be complementing you and not mirroring, like not should be an identical to you. If I've got a talking strength, everybody else has got a talking strength, then I, I don't know if anybody is going to be listening then, right? You see the point. So, so I think always try to build a team which is complementary. And, um, and another lesson I can, of course, give from the customer success perspective is that see, there are two ways to grow. You can build the product, crack the sales and marketing and try to get the growth. And then the moment you get the growth, you are given a lot of funding and you accept a lot of huge targets only to realize that, oh shit, I'm getting a lot of customers for which I'm you know, paying, uh, uh, I'm spending you know, the cost of acquiring a customer, the CAC is huge and you have the muscle, you have the funding to, to do that. But if you're unable to retain them and you're struggling with 25, 35, even 40% churn, then, then what's the point? And then sort of it becomes a leaky bucket, which is non-sustainable. And very soon you sort of can get caught in a, in a cycle which, um, you know, where, where you are unable to grow. Now, the other approach is that you build a product, you get in your few first customers, but rather than trying to, you know, just focus on acquiring customers and, and sort of fixing those challenges of a, of a sales funnel, you, you make sure that your churn or your 
product adoption and the customer value delivery and your retention and renewal is also fixed before you go ahead and 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 solve your sales funnel you know problems that will make sure that when you do step on the gas pedal on the sales funnel because once you sort of go and declare that we found that we found the product market fit there there is no dearth of money today and there's going to be a lot of money which is which is going to be made available to you if so you wish to and that you know that when you press on the gas pedal you will be able to you know reach a speed and then you'll also be able to sustain that speed because you know you will not be uh, bitten by churn at that point in time so so essentially invest early in success that means don't you know we 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 bring in a lead you know anonymous visitor on your website becomes a lead once you get an email becomes an mql when they request a demo they become an sql when the sales guy accepts it becomes an opportunity then it's someday they become you know your customer and we call them closed one don't call them closed one call them still open one because then you have to take them to onboarding then you have to make sure that your value is delivered and hopefully you know you've got enough signals and you're you're tracking their adoption their value delivery in a very measurable way that is not driven by a bias of the individual dealing with them and then when they are consistently and you know you can see all your customers are getting value or getting to value that is when you that is when you know you've really closed one or at least that sort of loop is closed and now you can go back and and accelerate and fix your sales funnel and accelerate that no it makes it makes sense it's great advice there i think yeah you're right a, lo- a lot of companies uh, unfortunately have that whether it's a, a bad habit of you know winning the customer and the deal and then not having the next step as you say looking at the importance of the onboarding and then making that customer successful uh, you know and sticky on the uh, uh, on the platform and and hence the uh, i guess kind of the birth of uh, you, you know customer success and, and the importance of, of that. And given your focus on customer success, um, let, let's talk a little bit about the right org structure to drive customer success. Um, so take us through a little bit about that. No, absolutely. So, so see, as a customer success technology itself and the customer success function itself is, is more than a decade old now. But in spite of that, I think we're still at a very, very early stage. We, you know, uh, these are things that we're still figuring out. We, we did a very recent survey with, with the top 100 influencers top 100 leaders in customer success, rather. And uh, we we found that the practice of customer success, including building a team, founding a, you know, sort of setting up a team, knowing who to bring in your team, setting the right org structure, setting up even the right KPIs, is still a struggle in more than 50%. And and I think the the way we got the rating was on a scale of one to 10, that was rated about five in terms of the industry maturity. While some might be way ahead, handful, and majority of the customer success function, majority of the, majority of the organizations are very new in setting up their customer success function. And, and hence, you know, we see there is a lot of, a lot of chaos at times, which is going on in, in, you know, even before they get to the org structure, they're figuring out what needs to come first. Should the KPIs come first? Should the leaders come first? Should the team come first? Should the technology come first? Or should you set up the practices first? All of that stuff. So in, if, you, if you look at, I, I think if you look at the definition, or sorry, if you look at, look, at the, look at the steps in which you should be setting up customer success as a function, that needs to be driven by your customer success strategy. Your org structure should not define the strategy. Your strategy should define the org structure. And from there on, the technology and so on and so forth. So the, the, the first thing that you need to do is define your customer success strategy. And that is not, an, not a very straightforward thing because you've got lots and lots of you know, things that you want to consider. For example, if you are selling developer tools, now developers don't like speaking to other humans or other customers or sort of other sort of non-devs and but business people on the phone or on even on zoom calls but they're very good at reading documentation and and so your strategy will be driven by that on the other hand let's say if you're selling to a construction you've got some sort of a construction tech these guys are very uh, new to technology but they're very comfortable speaking to you on phone they'll be happy to more than happy to get any assistance so in terms of if we what we've seen is 
in a construction tech, for example, we've seen almost 20% of a SaaS, the entire organization dedicated towards the post sales outside of support, post sales serving the customer outside of support to basically ensure that the renewal revenue keeps coming in and essentially making sure that the customer is succeeding. That means they have to ensure that the product is getting adopted and so on and so forth. So you have to see a whole bunch of things. And I'll very quickly, you know, outside of those examples, I'll very quickly give those things. What is the maturity of your customer in terms of tech adoption? Is this the first time they're adopting a tech or you're replacing a tech? Uh, are they moving from a you know an Excel or a paper-based system to your technology, and then uh, you know are they tech agnostic or you know uh, are they tech averse or tech friendly? What is their nature in terms of how do they like to interact? Where do they hang out? And and all of those things will define. And but the, still, the, one of the some of the most important things and the more obvious ones are going to be what is the ACV, because your unit economics needs to absolutely work with your customer success strategy. You cannot have a unit economics. For example, if you're selling something for a for a $10 a month, that 100% has, has to be absolutely automated. There is no way you can ever provide a human touch. Let's say Netflix, you're never going to get a call from someone from Netflix you know, to, to recommend movies to you. That's obviously not going to happen. They might do it as a sample to collect some very detailed data, but, but usually never outside of that. But then you get to, let's say, somebody you know let's say an acv of thousand dollars that's where at best at best you can provide you know a couple of trainings onboarding support if at all then you get to five to ten thousand dollar sort of a acv range that's where you absolutely must provide guided onboarding because because the underlying challenge or the problems that your product is likely solving is also getting more complicated more mission specific more function specific because that's the reason why they're paying you ten thousand dollars in ACV. But as you move from ten thousand dollars to maybe fifty thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollar range, that's where the, the problems become even more complicated. The solutions become even more complex and require a lot more guided support. And that's where you know your your strategies need to be even more focused towards handling that sort of a complexity, providing more white glove service being more personalized that means a lot more human touch a lot more human guidance a lot more human driven interventions and and so basically we're moving on automation 100% tech touch self self onboarding self trained on the other hand to to millions of dollars worth of arr where everything is run like a project 6 months worth of onboarding where you go basically park yourself in the customer customers conference rooms for, for six months and you camp there and then so on and so forth. So once you've got that strategy nailed, that is when you start thinking about your customer success KPIs and those KPIs should then define who the leader should be. And then that, that leader or within that leadership, you, you define what your org structure can be. Any, any thoughts or questions on that? Otherwise I can go to the KPIs very quickly and then see where we go from there. No, no, I think it's good. It's, uh, going through the uh, the KPIs, so that's great. You, you know, great insights there, and we we touch on the KPIs that that'll be useful. I've yeah, got it. That was my thirty minute alarm that I'd set for the time limit, but I quickly sort of try to touch upon the rest of the pieces. So, so I think another very very uh, moving thing is what should be the KPIs. So a lot of people, everyone knows that that you want to get to one hundred twenty five percent MRR or ARR retention, but that cannot be your first quarter goal. Everybody knows that I want to get to the top of the mountain or the top of the Everest, if you're climbing that Everest. But more important is what are going to be your different, you know, what's going to be the track? What is going to be the first goal, the second milestone, third milestone, so on and so forth. That's going to be important. So for example, to start with, I think your first milestone can be onboarding. Unless you've nailed onboarding, there is no way you can, you can start to, you know, nail retention. From onboarding, you get to retention. From retention, you get to upsells and then so on and so forth. Try to try to sort of roll it out just like it. So it's it's going to take time. This is not going to be a quick thing that you that you build a team, give them a tech, and then next quarter everything's solved. Just like it took, I think every founder knows that it takes many quarters, if not many years, to solve your sales funnel. Similarly, your your retention journey is going to be going to go through multiple quarters, if not multiple years, uh, to get to that 125% MRR retention. So there is no quick fix. So you need to be patient. You need to be clear about strategy. You need to be very comfortable with experimenting with, with failing. So start with 
a KPI which is achievable while realistic and being challenging at the same time, and and something where you can see quick, you know, quick sort of gains and and within three months, six months sort of a time frame. And under that KPI, then you take, then you go to okay, who's going to deliver that KPI? That's going to be a CS leader. And within that CS leader, you want to see where do this this leader needs to roll up to. If onboarding is a problem you're solving, maybe it's fine if you've got a junior leader to roll up to product manager temporarily if you're very early. But obviously, all CS eventually needs to roll into CEO. There is a huge debate that, you know, should customer success roll into sales or should they be independently rolling into CEOs? Obviously, rolling into sales is a big no-no. Sales need to absolutely be specialized into, into focused on new acquisitions. Retention is a different specialization by giving both these pieces to a single leader, which is, let's assume your sales leader or your VP of sales is going to be, you know, basically dividing the sales leader strengths and, and leadership bandwidth into two pieces. Both of them require independent and very important attention. So, you know, without without even, you know, getting into the, the strengths of a sales leader, I think their core obviously is acquisition. So eventually you want to have a CS leader rolling into the CEO directly. Now, that sort of is the, is the equation. There is a birth of CRO. When you grow beyond tens of millions of dollars in ARR, a CRO makes sense because there'll be other moving parts there, uh, both support and and recurring revenue can potentially roll. Sometimes even the VP of sales rolls into CROs. So CRO role is also sort of getting redefined and and sort of people are getting uh, figuring that out. But a CRO needs to be more, you know, more more leadership driven and not more financial driven. If you've got finance driven CRO, then I think that's a very different ball game. I I don't have much finance trends to to comment on that but yeah so those are your kpis those are your your leader then you bring in the leader and then in terms of structure there are like four or five structures which which exist and as you grow from lower acv to to higher acv so 10 10 10 dollars a month to millions of dollars in acv you sort of move from left to right you start with just support at a bare minimum or support with in-app success where you can you know bring in a lot of in-app technologies like things like pendo and we've written more about it in our blog where you can guide and uh, your your users towards success in a very self-serving way so there you are thinking about an org structure where one individual can be from your product management background can be from your customer success background can set up all these automation even email intervention or automated intervention that customer success box-like platforms can enable. Then from there, if you go to next level where you want to bring in at least an onboarding person who's going to help the uh, your, your new customers to onboard. And after that, they're sort of on a self-serve path. So that's your next onboarding piece. And then the next structure can bring in a dedicated customer success manager in addition to an onboarding manager. That's where this individual is responsible for retention. And if your ACVs are small, then and your and your sales is only focused on acquisition, which should be the eventual goal. Then the CSM can also own dollar targets, and those dollar targets could be as a CSM. For example, I can own like a million dollars in my portfolio value, and uh, and my job will be to start with 100 accounts, million dollars, end of the year. Even if I have 90 accounts within the same cohort, I should be taking them to 1.5, 1.25 million dollar plus in terms of the goal. And then eventually, if you really have like, you know, millions of dollars worth of paying customers, then you, I'm sure you've got an army covering your, your customers, but uh, you definitely want to bring in, in addition to all of these players, stakeholders, you want to bring in account managers who absolutely wear a very dedicated sales hat because they bring in that specialization if your unit economics sort of allows. So I think those are some of the structures with which you can, you can start thinking. But while the goal of every CSR organization should be to own targets, unless you've got a dedicated account manager there, don't start with it. If you're just starting CSR, then I think that is like should be the eventual plan. Once you've matured the organization, don't start with giving them, you know, the the dollar goals. I think that might be too much to to, to begin with. Start with, like I said, small basic challenges and, and objectives like onboarding great stuff a lot, lots there but you, you know super useful uh information really appreciate you, you sharing that and so just conscious of time so I'll probably go to like two more 
questions. Um, you mentioned, I think earlier, a, a like a blog post of like a hundred influencers or something like that that you guys had done. Um, I've had the question sort of recently about like who people should be following in customer success, and I, you, you know, I, I kind of struggled with it a little bit. Um, I went uh, and I thought I'll ask some VPs of customer success who they're following. Uh, and actually, I mean, just I had one or two responses, uh, but they said, hey, look, you, you know, I'm not really inspired by anybody in customer success right now. I'm not following anybody. And that was their response to me. But my question to you is like, you know, if you want to learn more about customer success, who should the listeners be following? And, you, you know, uh, where is the content? No, absolutely. I think that was a fantastic question. And um, so I, I think the best advice I can or rather the best insight for us that I can give you is that. Um, you know, while we are all global, while we are all so many, but in customer success, it's a village at the top. So that means it's a very close-knit, very small community. I, I, I think rather than naming a leader or, or a few leaders in, in customer success to follow, what I will urge every founder, every listener of your podcast is to come join the community. The entire field is so new that we are all learning from each other every day. A lot of times, for example, all the insights that I've, or all the, all the stuff that I've shared are not really the, the learnings that I've had, but these are all the learnings that I've gathered over time by uh, dipping my toe into the community. And you don't have to be super active all the time. Uh, of course, that'll be amazing if you can be, but, um, but even if you just stay plugged in and, and dive in, even if you, you know, don't be afraid to ask basic questions and um, you know, you'll, you'll find so many, so many of customer success leaders and community members are more than willing to, to come out and help and, and do, uh, you know, do a lot of stuff. And there is not one community as well, but there are a bunch of them. They're, you know, I, I'm happy to share a link to a blog post. Probably, Alex, we can, we can add it to your podcast notes, uh, which, um, which can be a good pointer for, for yeah. all of your members. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, and, and finally, where? Where can people find you online, Pani? If they've got any questions about the podcast, they're more, you know, they're interested in customer success box or customer uh, success in general. Oh, sure. I'm, I'm mostly active on LinkedIn. Over the years, I've gotten more busy and less active, but I'm trying to always come back. So, uh, so now that I'm making it public here that I am available and to be found on LinkedIn, I'll try my best to be more active there. But yeah, LinkedIn's my, my place. I've tried to do, to, to be on Twitter, but but I've always sort of struggled with the, you know, there is an, there is a very real time thing to Twitter. So somehow I've always, uh, you know, with, with all the global time scales and stuff, it's been challenging for me. So I'm a LinkedIn guy. Long story short. Yeah. That's where you'll find me. I do hide somewhere in, in Reddit as well, but I don't want to give up, give out my secret name there. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, well, well, Panit uh, Kataria, CEO, co-founder of Customer Success Box. Thank you so much for, for dialing in from New Delhi today, uh, sharing these lessons with the SaaS audience and, and the SaaS Revolution show. Uh, really appreciate it. So, so thanks so much, uh, uh, Panit Kateria. No, thank you so much, Alex. And I think it's always a pleasure and always inspired by people like yourself who put together SaaS communities. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have been a SaaS founder, you know, without SaaS stock, without all the efforts that you and your team and, 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 and likewise your your peers in the industry have been doing it's it's always inspiring i'll always come in learn so much and and always go back more energized i think so it's been it's been a source of a lot of a lot of energy and uh, i think please please keep uh, spreading that awesome no i appreciate it appreciate it mean, means a lot well thanks Benit, and thanks everyone for listening uh, to this episode of the SAS revolution show